Hello everyone and welcome to lecture today. Today we'll be talking about uh, integrating in new coordinate systems, so doing double integrals in new coordinate systems with, with a focus on polar coordinates. So you'll hopefully recall from a previous calculus course and also from you know, our previous discussions about circles that polar coordinates are described as follows. So the polar coordinate transformation is giving the Cartesian coordinates as the following functions. x is equal to r times cosine theta, and y is equal to r times sine theta. For r greater than or equal to zero, and theta between 0 and 2 pi. And the main idea here is that this is a transformation of the Cartesian plane. So it's an alternative way of describing points in the Cartesian plane. The idea being that a given point in the plane x y any point can be described by two coordinates its x coordinate and its y coordinate and essentially what this corresponds to is a grid so this is the x axis this is the y axis and the idea is that any point can be uniquely de determined just by uh, giving its x coordinate and its y coordinate, which corresponds to the value of it along the x axis and the value of it along the y axis. Now, in much the same way, points in the plane can also be described via its polar coordinates. But the way that the polar coordinate system cuts up the Cartesian plane into, uh, you know, individual boxes, like you see here uh, in the Car Cartesian coordinates, or x, y, the plane is cut up into uh, rectangular boxes where any delta x so change in x, any change in y is given by a box of area delta A, which is delta x times delta y. So for fixed values of R, we have fixed circles of varying radius. And for fixed values of theta, we have straight lines. And so fixed values of the angle theta, remember the angle theta is the angle from the x-axis, uh, we have straight lines for each fixed value of theta. So th th these two coordinate descriptions can be used to define the same point in general. All right, so any point x, y can be described uh, in terms of Cartesian coordinates or in terms of its Cartesian its polar coordinates, its corresponding uh, values of r and theta, and vice versa. So the, the idea here is that we want to figure out how to properly integrate, take the double integral of a function in this new coordinate system. And uh, we'll develop in this lecture a procedure for doing that, not just for polar coordinates, but in general for a general coordinate system. So before we do this, let's kind of take a look at uh, the main difference and what the main difference is going to be in polar coordinates. And in general, this is going to be true for any new coordinate system. And looking at these two pictures, uh, you can hopefully see that the main difference here is that the shape of boxes in the, the new coordinate system in polar coordinates are fundamentally different than the shape of boxes in Cartesian coordinates. 
So if you take one of these coordinate boxes here, say, the shape of this box is directly determined by the boundaries of the box, the, the bounds in theta, as well as the boundaries of the upper and lower circle that define this box. So the idea here is that um, at all costs, in order to integrate properly in this new coordinate system, we have to uh, take this into consideration. You'll remember that when we did the Riemann sums in Cartesian coordinates, it was based on the area or delta aij of each small box in the partition, which is just delta xi times delta yj. In polar coordinates, we still have that, we'll call the area of the ijth box in our partition delta aij, but this is determined differently because the shape of the box is different. And to get some idea of what this should be for polar coordinates, we can use um, a, a nice idea that we, we have from a previous calculus course, which is that it's a formula for the arc length of a circle. You'll remember that delta aij, or I should say the arc length of a circle for any segment of a circle, if you take say some uh, segment of the circle right here, call it r, the radius of this segment of the circle, is rj and the arc length of this segment, call it delta sj, is going to be equal to rj times delta theta j, where delta theta j is the, the change in angle on that segment. And so this means that delta aij, or the area of uh, this box, is going to be approximately equal to, not the same, not exactly equal to, but approximately equal to the change in radius along the box. We'll call that delta ri multiplied. by the arc length along this sampled segment, delta sj. This is not an exact equality, but it's a, it's a good enough approximation. And so what this is saying is that uh, the, the area of any of these small boxes, when we do a Riemann sum uh, in polar coordinates, is going to be delta ri times delta We'll say rj times delta theta j or rj times delta ri delta theta j. You know, remember that when we take the limit of the Riemann sum in Cartesian coordinates, we get that dA is equal to dx dy in the integral when we're integrating. What this means is that in polar coordinates we expect that when we take the limit, so as the Riemann sum boxes get smaller and smaller and smaller, we expect that dA should be equal to r dr d theta. 
So DA, remember, it's called the area element. And what we're seeing is that the area element in the double integral changes when we go to a new coordinate system. Right? In polar coordinates, the area element is actually different. It's not just dr times d theta. It's dr d theta times r. So this is going to be the important thing that we have to generalize and we have to kind of develop a procedure to do this for a general coordinate system because there are actually many different coordinate systems that are very useful um, in uh, multivariable calculus for in integration. So let, let's see how to do this. So a general coordinate transformation from Cartesian coordinates is going to take the following form. The general coordinate transformation from coordinates x, y into new coordinates, we'll call the new coordinates u, v, is going to be x as a function of our new coordinates u and v and y as a multivariable function of our new coordinates u and v just like for uh, polar coordinates right our u is r in polar coordinates and our v is theta in polar coordinates and uh, the, the function for the coordinate transformation is just x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta so more generally, we can think that uh, a coordinate transformation is going to be, you know, we have old coordinates, x and y, and new coordinates, u and v. And uh, in general, uh, x is a function of the, the new coordinates, and y is also a multivariable function of the new coordinates. So just like before, the coordinate curves for Cartesian coordinates are just straight vertical lines for fixed values of x. In straight horizontal lines for fixed values of y. And when we go to a new coordinate system, just like in polar coordinates, we're going to have that the new coordinates, or the new coordinate curves, are not necessarily going to be lines. So we can just draw kind of a general picture to kind of wrap, uh, wrap our minds around this. The idea is that let's say you have... Um, that the coordinate curves are maybe very, very very, very complicated. So kind of like this maybe. So this corresponds to our new, it's called the u-axis, when v equals 0, and then when you 
fixed values of u, you get coordinate curves that maybe look like this. And let's just say that this is our v axis. So the, the horizontally moving curves here are fixed values of v, and the, the vertically moving curves here, say, are fixed values of u. And these are the coordinate curves for our new coordinate system, say. Just like before, for any given point, take a point, say, right here, okay, every different point x, y is also described in terms of coordinates u and v, but we have the, the exact same general problem that we did for the polar coordinate transformation, specifically that the small boxes in this new coordinate system have a different shape than uh, you know a rectangle. They're not rectangular. So what we have to do is figure out uh, exactly how to approximate uh, the area of these small boxes. So the way that we do that is by using uh, what we know about the partial derivatives and what we know from our previous calculus course, which is uh, you know, tangent vectors to curves. So whenever you have a fixed curve, you can construct the tangent vector to that curve. Specifically um, for the position vector here, it's in 2D. So the position vector for any point in our new coordinate system, we have uh, x as a function of u and v, and y as a function of u and v. And the z coordinate is 0. So we need to figure out a way of obtaining the tangent vector to the curve, and that, that's done by taking the, the partial derivative. So taking the partial derivative of the position vector, or dr du, at a given point, amounts to taking the x partial derivative with respect to u and the y partial derivative with respect to u. And this vector dr du at any given point, if you evaluate it, is exactly a vector that's directly tangent to the curve at a given point. So this vector right here is tangent to the curve at this point. Specifically, you know, the, the, an approximation to the distance, if you take a small, uh, a small distance, delta u, or a small change in u, is the vector dr du times delta u. And this is just the increment in the direction of, uh, of u. So this vector is a vector that's tangent to the coordinate curve. At any given point, and approximates the, the, the length, the magnitude of this vector approximates the length of the coordinate curve along that line for small values of delta u. All of this is for small values of delta u, and then we'll see small values of delta v as well. In a similar manner, the partial derivative of the position vector with respect to v is going to be the vector dx dv dy dv which means that the, the vector that's uh, approximating for a small change in v approximating the length of the coordinate curve 
is exactly the vector dr dv times delta v. is a vector that's tangent to the coordinate curve in the direction of the V axis. Well, this is a vector that's tangent to the coordinate curve in the direction of the U axis. So up in the drawing here, I'll, I'll highlight exactly how that in each individual color here, you have that uh, the vector dr du times delta u is this red vector right here. And the vector dr dv times delta v is this vector right here. So it's the blue. So we have two, at any given point, you can calculate these, these vectors and uh, we have that for small values of delta u and small values of delta v. We need to figure out a way of getting the area, or approximation to the area uh, of this, this new box in this new coordinate system. And you'll, you'll remember from a previous calculus course where hopefully you went over what's called the, the cross product, the vector cross product, that this can be directly obtained by taking the magnitude of the cross product of these two vectors. Specifically, you know, if you have a given, uh, at a, a given point and you want to figure out an approximation to the area delta aij for one of the uh we're doing Riemann sum say and uh we want to figure out delta aij in our new coordinate system this is exactly going to be equal to the magnitude of this vector the tangent vector uh, to the coordinate curve in the u direction which is dr du delta ui say cross cross product. So this this cross right here is the the vector cross product. So the magnitude of the vector cross product will give us this approximation to the area. One of the nice things about the, the, the vector cross product and the magnitude of the vector cross product is that you know, using the properties of it, we can actually factor out this delta ui and delta vj to get that this is the same thing as just the vector cross product of dr du with dr dv. That's the magnitude of this vector multiplied by delta ui delta vj. And, and to be to be accurate here, I have exactly equal to, but we should actually just make this an approximation. Because it's really just an approximation for small delta ui and small delta vj. But uh, in the limit, this becomes exact. So it turns out that this is this is the key to 
towards going through and uh, getting what the area element turns into for a double integral. It's this approximation right here. Specifically that in the limit, as the partition gets smaller and smaller and smaller, or the limit as delta ui and delta vj go to zero, we end up getting that exactly dA at any point, the area element at any point will be equal to the magnitude of this cross product times du dv. And this, this is exactly for any general coordinate system or coordinate transformation, how we need to change and update the area element in the double integral. Now you can go through and calculate this out in general, um, but uh, it, it, it's, it's relatively straightforward to go through and do so uh, using a little bit of your, your vector algebra. So what we know about the cross product. But what I want to do right now is kind of give you an alternative way of, of kind of viewing this, which is using what's called the Jacobian matrix. The Jacobian matrix is essentially, you can think of it as, uh, it's a matrix of the, the first partial derivatives of the coordinate transformation. So in some sense, we can think of this uh, as the, the, the first derivative of a given coordinate transformation. And this is just defined as the matrix that's constructed from drdu and drdv. It's something that we can actually do and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more when we do coordinate transformations in 3D. Uh, but uh, really all we need here uh, in 2D is a two by two matrix. So it's the, the U partial derivative of X and the V partial derivative of, of X. That's the first row of this matrix. And the second row of the matrix is the y partial derivative of uh, with respect to u and the y partial derivative with respect to v. And uh, a very, very interesting relationship between uh, vector calculus and uh, linear algebra is that uh, when we calculate the determinant of the Jacobian matrix, this is directly related to uh, that magnitude, the magnitude of uh, this cross product. Specifically, that it's related to the magnitude of the cross product uh, in, the, in, in the following way. So, if we take the determinant of the Jacobian matrix and take the absolute value of it, Remember that the determinant of a two by two matrix is going to be the product of the diagonal components. So dx du times dy dv minus the product of the off diagonal components. So dy du times dx dv.
and what's what's really neat mathematically is that this the absolute value of uh, the determinant of this two by two matrix is exactly going to be the, the it's the same thing it's identical to the magnitude of the cross product of the columns So here we're just DRDU, we're using just the, the first two components of DRDU because the third component is zero. Same thing with DRDV. But uh, these two things are identical to one another. So what, we, what we've shown is in general, for a general coordinate transformation, that DA is the, with, is the magnitude of this times DUDV is the same thing as the absolute value of the Jacobian determinant of the coordinate transformation times dv du. And this formula can be used for any coordinate transformation to determine the proper way of taking the double integral in your new coordinate system. This works for any valid coordinate transformation. So that there are, are many, many, many useful coordinate transformations. There, there's polar coordinates. Uh, this is the main one that we'll focus on, but there's also what are called um, parabolic coordinates. Uh, the, the, there's, uh, you know, you can generalize polar coordinates to elliptical coordinates. Um, there's even what are called bipolar coordinates. Uh, the idea is that in each one of these coordinate systems, um, they, they take uh, advantage of a different geometric symmetry uh, in, the, in the description, and they're useful in a wide variety of scenarios. Bipolar coordinates are very useful for uh, electromagnetic field calculations. Um, in, uh, if you if you look look these up, there's, there's a, a large number of different coordinate transformations, each one of which is useful in a different scenario. But let's just go through and we'll we'll, we'll try and apply this formula for our polar coordinate transformation to, to verify um, what we what we did at the very beginning, which was kind of you know an ad hoc uh, way of getting the Jacobian determinant. So the, the Jacobian matrix for polar coordinates is going to be the matrix dx dr, dy d theta, or d, dx d theta, dy dr, and dy d theta. which can be calculated using uh, the, the, the definitions of the coordinate transformation. So dx dr is the partial derivative of x with respect to r, which is going to be cosine theta. The partial derivative of x with respect to theta is going to be negative r sine theta. Partial derivative of y with respect to r is going to be sine theta. And the partial derivative of y with respect to theta is going to be r cosine theta. So therefore, the, the determinant of this can be calculated relatively, relatively quickly. The absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is just going to be the absolute value of cosine theta. times r cosine theta minus sine theta times negative r sine theta.
which can be directly simplified, you have an R common to both terms. So this is going to be the absolute value of R times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta and cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is just equal to 1. So the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is the same thing as the absolute value of R and R is positive so this is just equal to R which is a direct calculation that gives us the value of this Jacobian determinant and then uh, from our general formula which says that dA the area element in the double integral is the absolute value of the Jacobian determinant times dr d theta we have that this is going to be equal to r dr d theta and this directly verifies that the ad hoc uh, calculation that we did at the very beginning of the lecture so let's go through and do some examples of this and how to use this uh, in different polar coordinate integrals. It's a very, very powerful tool because it, it gives us uh, much easy in a, or much easier integrations um, to, to, to deal with, both in terms of bounds and in terms of um, actually uh, you know going through and doing the integral. So very often uh, this will make doing integrals easier in the sense that it'll it'll if we have this polar symmetry we'll be able to get um, the, the integral of a function by using simpler methods um, or more simple methods than we'd have to use doing the integrals in Cartesian coordinates so very often if an integral in Cartesian coordinates would have to be evaluated using say multiple trigonometric substitutions um, doing a polar coordinate transformation will turn the integral from you know, a trig substitution integral uh, into possibly um, a, a basic integral or uh, maybe a U substitution, you know, a much easier method in general. Um, and th that's kind of the idea behind a general coordinate transformation. So what we'll look at is the same problem that we looked at in the previous lecture which is uh, we end up going through and getting uh, the, the area of a circle. So in a previous lecture, we looked at the area of a circle. Say so the circle has radius A. And we want to say get exact expression for the area of this region. So we know that the area of any region is given by the double integral over that region of the function 1. You'll remember that setting this integral up in Cartesian coordinates and actually doing the integral, you have to go through and do a number. You know, if you do a, a, a main, mainly it's that trigonometric substitution, which is pretty long. Turns out that if we just go straight to polar coordinates, dA is going to change to r dr d theta and we have to determine the bounds of integration for this new region. Theta is the angle from the x-axis. So this is going from 0 to 2 pi. And r is going from 0 
a lower bound up to A for its upper bound. So you can already see that the integral we have to evaluate is much simpler and the bounds are also simpler. And if we go through and do this uh, double integral, you'll see that uh, the function we're integrating is also much simpler. The inner integral is the integral of r, which is r squared over 2 from a to 0. So that's just going to be equal to a squared over 2 times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 d theta. So this is equal to a squared over 2 times the integral of 1 d theta from 0 to 2 pi is just 2 times pi. The 2's cancel out and we're left with pi times a squared or pi times r squared. So we've shown that the, the area of r is exactly equal to pi times the radius squared, which is uh, you know, the exact same result that we got uh, when doing the integral in uh, Cartesian coordinates, but we got it at much less cost. Right? It's, it's much easier to evaluate. This also makes uh, that the volume example from before, the volume of a sphere, say, much easier to calculate. So the, the integral for the volume of a sphere in Cartesian coordinates ends up being uh, relatively complicated. It's so complicated, in fact, that I, I didn't bother doing it in the, the lecture on um, you know, integrating in Cartesian coordinates because it takes a while. You have to do uh, two separate trigonometric substitutions. It's possible to do, but uh, it's, it's not a very nice procedure. It's not a very nice integral to evaluate. It takes almost uh, probably two pages or so of, of math, two or three pages of uh, substitutions. But you'll remember that the formula that we got was that the volume of the sphere, we'll call it omega, and let's, let's draw a picture out of this sphere, we'll call it a, a sphere of radius A, So this is the sphere of radius A here. The volume of this region uh, was the double integral of the top surface minus the bottom surface, which ends up being 2 times the square root of A squared minus X squared plus Y squared. dy dx. This is the integral over that the region r which is the, the circle in the xy plane. Which is the, the trace of the, the shape at uh, z equals 0. So this, this integral, remember the bounds are relatively complicated and um, going through and doing the trigonometric substitution here is, is relatively complicated. Um, when, you, when you have to do uh, this, this integral right here, it takes a while in Cartesian coordinates. But the idea here is that in polar coordinates, it becomes re relatively straightforward. So in the xy plane, remember, this region r is the circle of radius A. And 
you always want to consider the, the, the traces when figuring out the bounds. But for this, this region, our bounds in polar coordinates are going to be relatively straightforward. It's going to be the... Uh, well, our bound for theta is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. And our bound for a, or for r, is going to go from 0 to a. And then we have to update our function here uh, to be in polar coordinates. So this will be 2 times the square root of a squared minus and we have to think about what x squared plus y squared is in polar coordinates. It's just r squared, the radius squared. So it's a squared minus r squared. And this is multiplied by dy dx, or dA, which we know now in polar coordinates is r dr d theta. So this right here is the correct uh, double integral that will give us the volume of this region. And uh, it's the, 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 the double integral in polar coordinates now. So you'll, you'll notice that uh, you know this still looks a little like a long integral, a little bit long. But it, it's not nearly as bad as the integral from before. Uh, specifically, right, this is an integral, the inner integral here is an integral that we can evaluate using a straight u substitution. So the first thing is that this 2 will come out. And if we do a u substitution of a squared minus r squared, and remember du will be equal to negative 2 r dr. And actually, uh, we don't even need to move this 2 out. This is the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And then the, the lower bound is when e, e, r is equal to 0. So that, that means that u is equal to a squared. And when r is equal to a, you get that u is equal to a squared minus a, which is 0. This will be times the square root of u. Then you have 2r dr, which corresponds to negative du. It's times negative du. So this negative sign switches the order of integration of this inner integral. We'll express square root of u as u to the 1 half. So this integral then is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the antiderivative of u to the 1 half is going to be 2 thirds u to the 3 halves from the bound a squared to 0. That's the inner inner integral. And when you plug in the bounds here, when you plug in 0 here, it gives you 0. When you plug in a squared, you get a squared to the 3 halves, which is just a cubed. So this is going to be 2 thirds times a cubed times the integral of 1 from 0 to 2 pi, which is 2 thirds times a cubed times 2 pi, or 4 thirds pi times a cubed. is the exact formula you'll remember from uh, from 
you know, maybe a high school geometry class for the volume of a sphere. So you can hope, hopefully see that this is a very, very powerful method. It's so, so powerful, in fact, that it, it can be used in um, you know, a wide variety of applications. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into the, many of the, 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 the engineering applications um, in the, the next lecture uh, of the double integral. But anytime you have a double integral, you can use a new coordinate system if uh, your domain is, 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 is symmetric with respect to that e the new coordinate system. Um, and it, it can very, you know, help you very quickly get the correct value of the integral. So the final example we're con we'll consider actually is not, not an engineering example, but it's actually uh, an application to probability. And uh, in probability, there's a, what's called a, a probability distribution that uh, many of you will uh, actually know as the bell curve or the normal distribution. And simply put, what, th what this describes is what's called a random variable. That random variable could be a number of different things. Say, for instance, uh, grades in a class or test scores, um, uh, average height, average uh, any property that you can think of. Uh, uh, it doesn't always follow the normal distribution, but very, very, very frequently, you have that uh, real physical um, you know, measurements will follow what's called a normal distribution uh, or a bell curve, and that, that's essentially uh, a curve that is centered around some mean. And you also have this parameter called the standard deviation. Or standard difference or di distance from the mean. A you can think of it as the average distance from the mean. And the bell curve has the following shape. It comes up. Like this, and then it comes down. And it's symmetric about the mean. So it, it describes, uh, you know, wh whenever you have uh, some measurement or some phenomena that's centered about a mean, and uh, you know very quickly, uh, the the probability of occurrence gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you move away from that mean value. So here, mu is the mean, and sigma is called the standard deviation. And in a general probability and statistics class, you'll learn about what are called probability density functions. And uh, that for any given random variable, you can uh, describe that random variable using its probability density function. Um, so the probability density function for the normal distribution is the following function. It's one over sigma times the square root of 2 pi times e to the negative 1 half x minus mu over sigma squared. Okay, this, this, this curve, or the, a curve with this shape, gives us exactly this, uh, this bell curve. This is the exact function that gives you the bell curve. Um, and uh, you know th there are many reasons for this, many ways of kind of describing this. It's actually a really interesting theorem that y you'll get to uh, in probability and statistics called the central limit theorem, which uh, in some sense roughly states that uh, the average of multiple samples right, of um, a given random variable 
will eventually converge to this normal uh, distribution, uh, which is very a very, very powerful idea, and it's apply, applied all of the time in what's called hypothesis testing. Um, but the main thing for us is to, to look at uh, you know, a relatively, um, one of the you know, most important things here uh, in province stats, which is how to determine what's called the normalization constant. So this constant in front of the exponential, I'm circling it right here, this is called the normalization constant. And essentially what this does is it guarantees that the area under this curve or the area under the probability density function so this area right here this normalization constant guarantees that this area is equal to 1 which is extremely important in probability and statistics. For any probability uh, density function, this normalization constant has to be chosen so that the area under the probability density function, or the integral from negative infinity to infinity of the probability density function, so this is chosen, the normalization constant has to be chosen so that area under the PDF is 1. This improper integral from negative infinity to infinity of the probability density function has to be equal to 1. And you, you look at this, you see 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi. Now you could ask, where is this, where is this coming from? And it turns out that um, uh, we, we can go through and, and directly do this right, by, by uh, considering uh, actually a multiple integral. So we kind of use a little bit of a trick and um, uh, we, we, use, we use multivariable integration and we also use uh, polar coordinates in order to find, find this. Um, the reason that this has to be true is because in some sense this is mathematically equivalent to saying that all probabilities mathematically sum to one. But the sum of every single outcome, every single possibility has to be equal to one. Now, a, a deeper discussion of this is definitely had in a, a probability and statistics course, but for us, we're, we're just gonna take the fact that we want this integral to be equal to one and go through and see exactly how to, how to, how to, how to ensure this, how to figure this out. And we're, we're going to do this um, by considering the following. We'll go through and consider just for what's called the standard normal distribution. So we're going to, the standard normal distribution is a normal distribution with mu equal to zero, so a mean of zero, centered at zero, and a standard deviation of one. So it's a bell curve that's centered at zero and has a standard deviation of one. It still has that bell shape though. In this case, the function that we're dealing with, we want to normalize or figure out what the constant, uh, we'll call it c, should be, such that c times 
e to the negative x squared over 2, the integral of this function is 1, the improper integral from negative infinity to infinity. So the integral of this function has to be equal to 1. So this is the same thing as c times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 being equal to 1. And just for simplification, if we will call this i, because this is the integral that we want to figure out now, but uh, this normalization constant c should be equal to 1 over i. To satisfy the equation c times i is equal to 1. So if we can figure out the integral of this function, then we have our normalization, our normalization constant. So the trick here is that we need to figure out what i is. So you know, go through and calculate i, which is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared over two dx. So the question is how to determine this. And the, what, what you'll see is that this is a relatively difficult problem. It's, it's difficult because uh, of the fact that we've talked about before, the function e to the negative x squared over 2, right, and specifically the antiderivative of the function e to the negative x squared over 2 does not exist in closed form. meaning uh, that we can't express it in closed form or in terms of nice functions. So uh, doing this integral in a standard manner is uh, by finding the antiderivative of this function and then uh, uh, using our, our, our results on improper integrals to evaluate the, the limit is not gonna fly. We're not gonna be able to, to compute that. So we need to look for a different method of figuring out what this integral is. And it turns out that this is directly possible to do uh, using a multivariable calculus and polar coordinates in a very, very clever manner. So instead of solving for i, we consider solving for i squared, or i times i. Because if I can solve for i squared, and whatever result I get for i squared, I can take the square root of that result and uh, exactly have what i is going to be. So i squared is equal to i times i, where i is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 times the integral from negative infinity to infinity. And I'm going to use a different variable for this, this second integral because it's, it's a separate integral. You can use any variable you want because it's a dummy variable. So i squared is just the product of two single variable integrals. And what, what's very neat here is that one of our properties for the, the integral is that if you have two separate integrals uh, both being multiplied or both of different variables right two separate single variable integrals being multiplied together this is identical to the double integral of 
of the product of these two functions. which can be rewritten as the double integral e to the negative x squared over 2 times e to the negative y squared over 2 is negative 1 half x squared plus y squared. And uh, we also want to remember that this integral, right? This, these, what this, these bounds mean: negative infinity to positive infinity in x, and negative infinity to positive infinity in y. Right? These bounds are describing the entire real plane. So all of this, every single point in the real, the real, uh, the real plane, two-dimensional real plane. So this is an integral that looks very, very nice. Hopefully, if you look at it, um, you think about what this is going to look like in polar coordinates. It's a double integral that hopefully will be a little bit nicer in polar coordinates because it has a lot of uh, radial symmetry. It has symmetry around, um, you know, around. Uh, there's like no dependence on theta here at all. You'll see that directly that x squared plus y squared in polar coordinates is r squared. This will be e to the negative one half times r squared. And remember that in polar coordinates, dA is equal to r dr d theta. This is very important. So it's r dr d theta. this dx dy becomes r dr d theta, which is an integral that we can evaluate. Right? The, the inner integral here is, an, is a u substitution integral, and it's a relatively straightforward u substitution at that. We also want to consider the bounds. The, the bounds are going to be, and the bounds are going to be as follows. It'll be for theta from 0 to 2 pi, we want to describe every single point going around the origin. And then our R bounds to describe every single point in two-dimensional space, we have to go from zero in R all the way out to positive infinity. And that will allow us to describe every single point in two-dimensional space. So even, even the bounds become nicer in polar coordinates. This is going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And now we can go through and actually um, evaluate this using improper integrals. The inner integral here is an improper integral. So it's going to be the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to b of r times e to the negative r squared over 2 dr d theta. So remember from a previous calc course you should remember improper integrals and that, that's, that's how we evaluate that inner integral using uh, a limit. And uh, we can simplify this a little bit by using u substitution. So we do a u substitution of u is equal to r squared over 2. And du will be equal to r dr. This will be the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 0 and then so if r when r is 0 u is 0 when r is b u is b squared over 2 so it's uh, the limit 
as b goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to b squared over 2 of e to the negative u du. So this is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the limit as b goes to infinity. This antiderivative is going to be negative e to the negative u from b squared over 2 to 0. And when you plug in the bounds, this becomes the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the limit as b goes to infinity of will be e to the 0, which is 1, minus e to the, the, the b squared over, negative b squared over 2. The limit of which is equal to 1. The limit of 1 is 1, and the limit of e to the negative b squared over 2 is equal to 0. So this is just going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 minus 0, or the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1, which is equal to 2 pi. So that's it. That, that's the value of, of that, that integral, which remember, this double integral is the same thing. And we're going all the way back to the very beginning as i squared. So what we've shown is that i squared is equal to 2 pi. means that i, the integral that we're looking for, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 is equal to the square root of 2 pi. And our normalization constant, c, for the probability function, the probability density function, is going to be 1 over i or 1 over the square root of 2 pi, which is exactly what we had uh, when, it, when we wrote down uh, the general standard normal distribution. Uh, now, remember, th this calculation is for the normalization constant for a standard normal distribution. Um, for the general normal, dis the general normal distribution with a, a non-zero uh, or non 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 one value of the standard deviation sigma you're going to have a little bit of a change here. You'll have a, a, a sigma that appears uh, as we, we wrote down before. But the idea is that, um, that we, I'm trying to convey with this example is that a you know, multivariable integration is actually very, very useful even uh, when applied sometimes for certain scenarios to single variable integrals. Uh, and polar coordinates are essential to uh, going through and in, in, in figuring out very often um, what a double integral is uh, for many different types of applications, but specifically when you have polar symmetry. So that, that will conclude the lecture for today. Thank you very much for tuning in. I uh, hope you learned something and had a great day.